Hi everybody, welcome back to Office Hours with the Professor, the show where I say things. And man, has it been a while. It's been a few months since my last video, I think since like October or November even. So I hope everyone's been doing well. Uh, it's been a busy winter for me. Uh, I've actually got some cool news. I've just been accepted to the University of Alaska Fairbanks graduate program in applied linguistics. Woo! Yeah, so I'm so happy. I just have to tell everybody. Uh, you know, I've been dreaming about this for probably a decade now. And some people have asked me why in the world I want to go to Alaska of all places. You know, after all, there are plenty of perfectly serviceable grad schools in places where coffee, uh, I don't know if you've seen these videos where they throw the hot coffee up in the air and it vaporizes because it's so cold, but there are plenty of graduate schools in places where, where that doesn't happen. Well, first of all, I love cold weather, so that's not really a problem. Second of all, UAF is probably the single best place in the world to get a background in the Nadine language family. Now, if you're a fan of my show, you might already know how important this is to me. Now that I have a little background with Ket, I'd really like to look at the other side of the proposed Dene Yenizean language family. The most important thing now, I think, is to work on a solid reconstruction of proto nadine and start to reconstruct the folklore passed on from such a culture. And I believe this is going to be the ultimate key to solving the dene Yenizean question once and for all. Given the amazing work that UAF's Alaska Native Language Center has done with the Nadine languages, there's probably no better place in the world for me to go and do my grad school. So eventually, I'd like to move on to my PhD, of course, but, you know, that's still a few years off. So, anyway, thanks for listening. Back to cavemen. Yes, in the footsteps of the brilliant Wu-Tang Clan. Today, we're going back to two million years ago. From the land of the Lord, behold the pale horse, or follow me. Woo! A new homo species has emerged, the first to spread outside of Africa, although recent evidence may dispute that. Okay? And just like the woo, this is happening around two million years ago. Now, this species is known in Eurasia as Homo erectus. <laughs> upright man, and in Africa as Homo ergaster, or working man. Now, there are a lot of cool facial reconstructions that you can Google, and our ancestors apparently looked a lot like Charlie Day. Apparently, Dayman is also a time-traveling Homo erectus. Cool! Now, we've got a lot to go over today, so I'm just going to talk for 10-15 minutes, see how far we get, okay? And then we'll just put the rest of it in another video, right? I don't want people getting bored and stuff like that. Let's review. Sometime around 2.8 meow. The genus Homo emerged with these weird little dudes that we call Homo habilis, right? And since I'm focusing on behavior in this series, we talked about how they probably didn't act very differently from their Australopithecine brethren. Although, a careful observer might have noticed certain traits arising from their much larger brains, for example, uh, in greater quality discrimination when using stone tools or a greater tendency toward teamwork, right? And around two million years ago, these guys had acquired a number of traits that began to set them apart as a new species. Arguably, 
the first creatures that may have been recognizably, visually recognizably human. In the words of my paleoanthropology hero, John Shea, if you saw one from a distance, you'd say, well, there's a large naked man over there, but it's a man. So somewhere around this time, an evolutionary split happened. Now for now, we're going to follow the adventures of the Homo ergaster and Homo erectus lineage. But I want you to keep this in the back of your mind. Somewhere in between Habilis and Ergaster, okay, a line split off that would just fall off the map for an astonishingly long time, and then it would pop up again in some very unexpected places. So keep this just in the back of your mind. Well, at any rate, these Ergaster creatures, they spread across Africa, okay, and from there to the warmer regions of Eurasia. Now, due to the eternal conflict in the academic community between lumpers and splitters, there's some debate over whether the African and Eurasian finds represent the same species. Now, typically, as I say, African finds with these traits are referred to as Homo ergaster, okay? And Eurasian finds as Homo erectus, but they're although a splitter would disagree, there are a lot of people who say that they're basically the same species. Now, when we look at the clues that they've left us, there's something extremely human-like in the way they lived. In my layman's opinion, this must really have been the time when humanity's ancestors struggled and clawed their way out of the animal world, and they really developed that consciousness and awareness that more than anything, makes us who we are. And one of the wonderful things about Homo ergaster, Homo erectus finds is that here we can actually start to work out the details of individual lives. Now, the first of these cases is from Demanisi in Georgia. The second of these cases is from Lake Turkana in Kenya. So here we have one from Eurasia, so as we would say Homo erectus, right? And one from Africa, as we would say Homo ergaster. So we're going to start with the older of the two, which you'd think would be the African one, but it's not. The older of the two is the Demanisi fight. African killer news black watch on your radio, blowing out your watch from Park Hill, the house of Haunted Hill. Every time you walk by your these remains appear to reflect one of the very earliest migrations of the genus Homo outside of Africa. And they represent a very early form of erectus that dates back to about 1.8 nya, such that when these bones were first found, there was actually some argument whether they in fact represented a previously unknown species. And again, the splitters would say, yes, this is in fact Homo georgicus, but the mainstream opinion right now we would say is Homo erectus. The finds included five skulls, and these gave us a look at the variation that existed between the early erectus crania. And the findings therefrom have proven controversial, but that's not really my area. I'm not much of a numbers guy. Instead, what hit me like a freight train was the more human side of the find. And this is really staggering. Here, we see the first evidence of care for the elderly and infirm. So, let's take a look at Demonisi Skull 4, or as I like to call him, Grandpa George. The skull appears to be that of an elderly male. And here's what he might have looked like when he was still alive. I've lost a few more hairs. I think I'm, I'm going bald. That's one smug caveman. Astonishingly, by the time of his death, this dude had lost all but one of his teeth. Well, that explains his dying, you might say. Back then, without teeth, you were pretty much done for. Well, not so fast. Examining the jaws, we see evidence of bone resorption, okay? 
So basically, that means that the bone tissue around the empty tooth sockets was broken down and released into the bloodstream. That implies that he survived for a while, maybe even years without teeth. During this time, someone else must have supported him. You know, generally, toothless geriatrics are not the spryest of people. So it seems unlikely that he could have survived long on his own. His family must have cared for him in his old age, perhaps even to the point of chewing his food for him before he swallowed it, since, after all, dentures had yet to be invented. Another possibility is that he or his family processed the food in some way, maybe by grinding it up or perhaps even by cooking to make it softer. And here's my attempt at drawing Grandpa George Hughes's one tooth right there. Anyway, it's really impossible to overstate how huge of a step this is, okay? Elder care is a uniquely human trait. You know, great apes don't do this. Older members of a chimpanzee community, they would fall behind, maybe fall behind the group, and they don't last long. Grandpa George, on the other hand, had this prehistoric social security scheme to fall back on. You know, he spent his youth paying in, that is, contributing to the tribe's welfare, protecting it from enemies, of course, reproducing. Now that he's old, he has someone to fall back on who apparently felt some kind of familial obligation toward him. So for the first time in the human ancestral record, we're seeing evidence of a family structure, family, vaguely echoing our own. Whoever took care of Grandpa George loved him in the same way that we love our grandparents. They understood that they had some special duty to Grandpa George, <laughs> duty, that went beyond simply what he could provide for them, which by the time he died probably wasn't much in terms of tangible food production or labor contribution. Regardless, they saw something of value in his very being, a distant precursor to the same respect in which our societies properly ordered hold the aged. So, when we look at his skull, I suggest that we are looking at nothing short of the birth of human dignity. I often wonder what the relationship was like between Grandpa George and his larger community. Was he a patriarch held in loving reverence by his family, a walking link to the tribe's past? Did, did he smile as he clung to the back of the young man carrying him, remembering when he carried that same young man as a child? When the tribe stopped for the night, was Grandpa George fussed over by his children and grandchildren, and was he given the best morsels of each kill and tenderly embraced for warmth against the chill of night? Or was he a cringing scavenger, derided and resented by the tribe, fed on the tribe's leavings, and only grudgingly brought along from one place to another? Well, my leaning is toward the former. Since, in the latter case, resentment toward him as a freeloader would have gotten the best of the community as soon as his productivity ceased. Just like with modern great apes, he would simply have been left behind by the group, if not outright killed. Besides, we have evolved in the present to respect the elderly, so it only follows that our ancestors did not act differently. The follow-up question, then, would be this. How would the younger members of the community have looked at? Would they have some abstract concept of a parental figure taking root in their minds by this time? Would they have recognized him as their father or their grandfather? Had the concept of the family been invented, or did they just do family without thinking about family? My guess is that no, they would not have looked at him and thought the equivalent of, this is my dad. However, perhaps it was something more like, 
this is the old man, or the old one, who I remember carrying me as a child, who fed me with food he had killed, who protected me. He loved the one whose milk I drank. We belong to one another, and I must protect him in his infirmity. I was about to say, so I must protect him, but I wouldn't go that far. Positive reasoning is a huge mental step forward, one that I doubt our ancestors had made by this time. Of course, they probably did not speak either, but if they could have, I imagine they would have said something along those lines. Whatever their relationship, Grandpa George was cared for and loved, and when he did pass away, whether from a disease, from a bad fall, or, or maybe a lion, finally, after all these years, got the jump on him, I believe that Grandpa George was mourned and missed. Rest in peace, Grandpa George. Paper towels. So, we're now going to move 200,000 years forward in time. The 1.6 Mia, but to a part of the world we're already quite familiar with, East Africa. In 1984, near Lake Turkana in Kenya, a wonderfully complete skeleton of a young Homo ergaster child was unearthed, and it led to a plethora of interesting discoveries. Let's take a look at who we're dealing with. And here's a reconstruction of him looking miffed at having suddenly been teleported into the modern world. Now, if you're like me, you're probably thinking, wow, this kid must be pretty badass to grow a beard at his age, apparently through sheer force of anger alone. Well, I'm no paleo-forensic reconstructionist, but I think that this reconstruction that I showed you is probably the best that a Google image search can offer at the moment. Facial stubbery and all, I'll have you know he puts me to shame. My reasoning is that by this time, we had lost most of our body hair, but we hadn't lost all of it, hence the beard. We started losing our body hair around 2 million years ago. However, this process was probably quite gradual, and it didn't complete until we developed the dark pigmentation that would protect our hairless bodies from the sun. This development, as far as we know, didn't emerge around until around uh, 1.2 million years ago. But let's take a look at what Turkana Boy can teach us. For one thing, we see that he probably did not live a very comfortable life, even by lower Paleolithic standards. For one thing, the arrangement of Turkana Boy's spinal column shows us that he had a slipped disc in his lower back. And if you've ever had one of these, you know they can be excruciatingly painful. These days, we can go to the chiropractor or even get spinal surgery. But poor Turkana Boy had no way of relieving his suffering or even knowing why he was in such pain. And as if that weren't enough, the little dude also had an abscessed jaw. When one of his baby teeth came out, apparently something went wrong and a terrible infection set in. In the end, he probably died of the resultant blood poisoning. How awful, how full of suffering his life must have been. His poor family, too, did their best to take care of him, but in the end, they just couldn't help him. Similarly to Grandpa George, I often wonder how Turkana Boy interacted with his tribe. Was he taken care of willingly or grudgingly? Maybe he was taken care of along with the younger children by the moms of the tribe, but was subject to some degree of impatience from the males. After all, by his age, he would have been expected to begin contributing to the group hunts. Speaking of age, how old was he when he died? 
This is a cool question because a different story is told by bones and teeth. According to microscopic analysis of his teeth, he died around eight years old. However, if we look at the rate at which his bones were growing, he seems to have entered early adolescence, perhaps comparable to maybe a 12-year-old kid today. That's interesting because it shows that Homo ergaster reached maturity much faster than modern kids. So let's compare that to the life cycle of a chimp, which reaches adulthood around 10-ish. I'm not sure what the implications here are for behavior. Perhaps ergaster would have been acting essentially as an adult by 12 or so. Now that I think about it, however, it's not that different from some traditional communities today. You know, lots of adulthood rituals and initiations happen around that age. Consider, for instance, the bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah of Judaism. Another important discovery from Turkanaboy is that his vocal capabilities, his vocal uh, hardware, so to speak, had not developed to the point where he would have been able to talk like we do, at least in the way we think of speech. Any form of vocal communication between these creatures would have been quite crude and probably of a strictly utilitarian nature. It may be, however, that things like specialized mouth movements and vocalization were just beginning to lead Ergaster down the road that would eventually lead to things like, like speech and not just that, but dance, music, even ritual itself. Back, back and forth. So let's talk about the sociality of Homo ergaster Homo erectus. Grandpa George and Turkana boy most importantly showed that the goodness of humanity, compassion, familial love, altruism, outdate, quote, humanity itself. We certainly would not have considered these creatures human in the sense that you and I are human, but there certainly are human-like qualities to their social behavior. In addition to their willingness to take care of one another, we can also infer that Ergaster erectus lived in something approximating what we would call a hunter-gatherer society. Cabalists and Australopithecines, on the other hand, probably lived in something closer to the communities of modern chimpanzees. Rather than being formed around a dominant male and his mates, Homo ergas or Homo erectus communities were probably more egalitarian and they were held together by social and familial bonds. So human-like was this social behavior, in fact, that we are reasonably confident that Ergaster erectus lived for the first time in what would be recognizable as a true hunter-gatherer band society. Excavations from Encampments from this period show different areas that were used for specialized tasks, as well as the remains of hunted, butchered, and cooked game. Some of us, probably the elders, the moms, and the kids, would have hung around the camp and taken care of things like food processing, while the able-bodied adults were out hunting. How do you hunt, you might ask, if all you have is this stone tool that you have in your hand? Easy if a bit inconvenient. You find an animal, chase it until it's exhausted, and then kill it up close. Homo ergaster Homo erectus was an accomplished distance runner, on par with modern Olympians as their skeletal remains show. Most big game mammals can run away in the short term, but if you chase them over a long period of time, hours or even days, they'll eventually overheat and get exhausted. So, as we lost our body hair, and we became better able to regulate our body temperature, and hence gained the ability to outlast our prey. It's just like the uh, tortoise and the hare, except in the end, the hare gets his head bashed in with a rock. <laughs> this kind of, anyway, this kind of endurance hunting in small bands proved quite successful, and in fact is a living tradition in some parts of Eastern and Southern Africa even today. How awesome is that? There are modern people 
right now practicing a traditional way of life that goes back at least a million years. A way of life older than modern humanity itself. It's really quite humbling. Here in the West, we think uh, tradition goes back a long way if your grandparents were doing it. And the Kalahari, the family business, was started by Homo ergaster. All right, well, that's about as much time as I've got right now, but we have way more of this stuff to talk about. So in the next video, we're gonna talk about dating, toolkit. We're even gonna talk about the beginnings of abstract thought, stuff like that. So stay tuned and don't worry, I've got all this stuff written down already. So I'll get to work on the next video right away. So I'll see everybody soon. Take care. That's what I'm talking about. Step to my groove, move like this. When we shoot the gift, of course it's ruthless. Grab the mic with no excuses in a sec. Grab the text to do this. Executing, shaking no sets. And now I'm breaking all hex. I'm taking all bets. Move on best. Who 